clearly that's not the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but what is? What is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? There's a lot of discussion about it. There's a lot of disagreement about it. And for some, it might come as some surprise to know that the term baptized in the Holy Spirit or to be baptized with or any sort of derivation thereof, it's only mentioned really four times that way. One of the times that's mentioned is Matthew chapter three. We see this a few times in the Gospels. As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. This is John speaking. For he who is coming after me is mightier than I and I am not fitted to remove his sandals, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And so there's a few times that we see this. We see this in the gospel. And there's one other time that we also see this. Let's go to Acts chapter one, where Jesus is speaking to the disciples. He says, chapter one, verse five, it says, for John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. The problem is though, it tells us what's going to happen but it doesn't really describe what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. And there are some versions may say baptize with, in, or of the Holy Spirit. The word that's used there is the Greek word on, and it conveys all of those. And so that's not really a big issue. But what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and then what is it not? And that's something that we also need to deal with, what it actually is not, because we don't want to have any sort of confusion. Now, remember, the Bible is trying to get us to see the condition of man. Man might want to do good. In many cases, he doesn't want to. But even if man does want to do good, he just does not have the ability to consistently do good, to consistently do well. And that's a problem. That's an issue of the heart. And the Bible has told us what God wants to do with the heart. As a matter of fact, in Ezekiel 36, God states that I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. Now, this has to do a little bit with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. However, this is not the baptism. What he's speaking of here is a person's heart being regenerated. And so we don't want to confuse regeneration with baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, regeneration ultimately is going to lead a person to be baptized because this regeneration, this change of heart, is what is going to be what causes a person or leads a person into belief. And in, in this case, a consistent belief. And then there's another issue related to the Holy Spirit that we'll talk about just a little bit that is also not the same as being baptized in the Holy Spirit, that is being filled with the Holy Spirit. What we need to remember is this. There is no command for us to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. That is something that is done to us, as John says, and as Jesus says also, Jesus is the one that's going to do this. So in order to see what it actually does, let's go to John 15. Jesus is getting ready to die. He's getting ready to be crucified and he's preparing the disciples for this day. And he makes a statement about the Holy Spirit coming upon them. He says in John 15, 26, he says, when the helper, the obviously that's the Holy Spirit, the parakletos, the one that comes alongside and helps them, who will come, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me, and you also will testify because you have been with me. So what is the Spirit going to do? The Spirit of truth is going to do the one thing that Jesus is doing also, and that is to testify of him, what? The gospel, to magnify him. Jesus, remember, in his earthly ministry was limited to one location. Wherever he was, was wherever he was. And so in that case, he was limited. Now, it's voluntary on his part. But what he's going to do is he's going to give mankind the Holy Spirit so that they can in turn be empowered to do his will. Remember, we also see this prophesied in Joel as well as in Acts when it happens on the day of Pentecost. And Peter is explaining, he says, and it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream. And so what's going to happen is the Holy Spirit is going to come upon us. And notice what he says, and they shall prophesy. This word prophesy, sometimes we confuse it for always meaning a foretelling or predictive prophecy, but the word just simply means to bring about a revelation. And so what does the Lord want us to do with the Holy Spirit? To bring about a revelation. In other, in other words, to empower or to be empowered by the Spirit for service, to build up people, to testify of Christ, to testify of his goodness, the gospel, and to build up the church or thereby building up the church. 
Now, Paul also brings this issue up in 1 Corinthians 12. Let's start in verse 1. He says, now concerning spiritual gifts, or in this case, the word that's actually used is pneumaticon. So he's speaking about concerning the spiritual things. That's literally what the word means. Concerning these spiritual things or spiritual gifts, he says, I do not want you to be ignorant. Well, we need to understand what's happening with the spiritual gifts or with these spiritual things. And if we drop down to verse 7, he makes an important statement. He says, but to each one is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. So remember I said that the point of the Holy Spirit, us being baptized in it, is that we would be empowered for service to do what? To build up the body. Because Jesus is the one that is baptizing us and you're not baptizing yourself, the Bible is clear that everybody that is in Christ has been baptized into the spirit by Christ. Paul goes on to say in chapter 12, verse, let's start in verse 12. He says, for even as the body is one, yet has many members and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body. So also is Christ. And look what he says, for by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit, which is important. Number one, the all means everybody. That means if you have been saved, you place your faith in Christ for one second, for one minute, one hour, one decade. It doesn't matter. All of those who are in Christ have been baptized into the Holy Spirit. Whether you are Jew, whether you are Greek, no one, there's no second class citizens in the body. Every believer has to have the Holy Spirit. If you have not been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you are not a Christian. Paul makes this point in Romans 8, 9. He says, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. And so if you do not have the spirit, if you have not been baptized into the spirit, then you do not belong to him. Now, let's make sure we understand this picture. To be baptized means to be dipped, to be immersed. That means to take on the qualities. The Bible knows of no Christian who does not have the Holy Spirit. The identifying mark of every Christian, of every believer, is the Holy Spirit. And so whatever you've been baptized into, you take on those qualities. For example, if I baptize or immerse a white piece of cloth, into red dye, that, that cloth is going to come up with the same qualities as that red dye. Similarly, if you have been baptized into the Holy Spirit, you will come up with the same qualities of the Holy Spirit. Will you have the same qualities perfectly? Well, obviously not, which is where this other passage comes in. And some and we, we sometimes confuse it. We should not. This is in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. It says, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation but be filled with the spirit. In other words, now it's not to say to be drunk with the spirit because this is a word, this word here, but is a word of contrast. So rather than having no control because of wine, you are to be controlled or have control with the spirit because we know one of the fruits of the spirit, one of the results of having the spirit is self-control. And why we know this is a difference between the baptism of the Holy Spirit and being filled. Remember, being baptized is something that is done to you by Jesus. But in this case, to be filled, this is something that you do. This word pleruste is something that you do to yourself. This is a middle voice, which means you do it to yourself on your behalf. It's a constant thing. It's a yielding of yourself, of your will for the benefit of the spirit to empower you even more so. So upon the profession of a person's faith that is brought about because their heart has been regenerated, that person then, according to the Bible, is taken by Jesus and baptized into the Holy Spirit, having the qualities of the Holy Spirit in them, working in them, moving in them. Now, there's going to be a, there's a bit of a controversy where some think that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a second act. It is not. And one of the passages that caused a little bit of this controversy is John 20. However, if we read it properly, we'll see that it's not saying that they are going to receive the Holy Spirit later. Let's go to John 20. Verse 22, and he says, and when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, the question is, did they receive the Holy Spirit then? Or is this telling them that they will receive the Holy Spirit? Is this pointing forward? Well, in this case, we know it's pointing forward. Here's how. Because Jesus also sees them again a little bit later after his death, burial, and resurrection. He sees them in Acts chapter 1. And notice what he says. Let's go back to it. After they saw him, let's matter of fact, let's start in verse four. He says, gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the father had promised, 
Well, what was the promise from the Father? What we read in chapter 15 of John, this Holy Spirit, the helper coming alongside them. And so they are to go and to wait for this promise. He says in verse 14, which he said, you heard from me. And John baptized you, here it is in verse 5, with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So they won't, they'll be baptized not many days from now. So clearly this hasn't happened yet. And we see it in verse 6. So when they had come together, they were asking him saying, Lord, is it at this time you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And the reason why they're asking this question is because they understand that when Israel is fully in power, then the kingdom will be restored. They're not understanding the timing and they don't know all of what God is going to do. And so this is what they're thinking in their mind at this point in time, then they'll probably go to heaven and be with the father. They, they, they're misunderstanding what God is trying to do. However, what does Jesus say to them? He says, he said to them, it is not for you to know times or epochs which the father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the world. And so Jesus is reiterating when the Holy Spirit comes upon him, he's reiterating what he told them in John 15. And so this is not them placing their faith in Christ and receiving the Holy Spirit and then waiting a little while later to get the baptism of the Holy Spirit again. They have not received it as of yet, according to what Jesus says. They have not been empowered as of yet. And then there's also another passage that kind of brings in some confusion. This is in Acts chapter 8, when the Samaritans have believed, however, they have not received the Holy Spirit. And so what does the church do? The church sends Peter and John down to Samaria, and then they give validity to these Jews, or to, I'm sorry, to these Samaritans to receive the Holy Spirit. Why is that? Well, what we have is something that, that's descriptive in Acts with the Jews, the Samaritans, and the Gentiles. We have people receiving the Holy Spirit and so that there would not be a divided body, which is why the body, or why the Bible talks about us as one body. Paul uses that analogy often because he doesn't want us to have a divided body. Remember, that's the whole thing with 1 Corinthians. He doesn't want us to have a divided body. And so it would be very divided if one group has the Holy Spirit and the others didn't. And so what did the Jews witness? They witnessed, obviously, on the day of Pentecost, the Jews receiving the Holy Spirit. They also witnessed the Samaritans receiving the Holy Spirit. How do they know the Samaritans received the Holy Spirit? Because Peter and John gave validity to it. How did the other Jews receive the Holy Spirit? Under the hands of Peter and John and the other Jewish disciples. And then we see the Jews also believing that the Gentiles have received the Holy Spirit. Why? Because these Jewish apostles have gone to them. And so now we see that we don't have a divided church and that everyone has received the Holy Spirit. We cannot take what was descriptive in Acts and make it prescriptive. Jesus stated that once they receive the Holy Spirit, they will be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, then Samaria, then the uttermost parts of the world to the Gentiles. And then it will be known that everyone can receive the Holy Spirit. And we know now everyone who has faith in Christ, who is a believer, that person has the Holy Spirit. Again, Romans says that if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you are not his. Paul tells us again that every believer has been baptized into the Holy Spirit, baptized into the body by the Lord. And so what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? It is Jesus upon the believer's profession of faith being baptized into the Holy Spirit. It's the identifying mark that every believer has being dipped into the Holy Spirit and being empowered for service to do what? To magnify Christ, to testify of him. In so doing, building up the body. It's not a lot of what we've seen, people running around and, and all these different things. No, because again, once you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, especially the more you yield to the Holy Spirit, then what we have more of? Self-control. And why do you want to have that? To do the work of the Father. Amen.